Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Positronic Man by Isaac Asimov and Robert Silverberg. So, as you can tell, this was co-written, I believe it's actually written after Asimov died. It's also based on um, Bicentennial Man, but fortunately for me, I have read the, the short story, I think it is, and seen the movie as well, um, but I don't remember it. So yeah, it does say, based in part on the short story, The Bicentennial Man. Copyright 1976. So I'll read you the blurb here, and then we're going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So the blurb. What does a robot have to do to prove its humanity? When NDR-113 came off the assembly lines of the United States Robots and Mechanical Men Corporation, it was no more than a positronic brain encased in more or less humanoid-looking housing made from metal and plastic. But NDR-113, or Andrew Martin as he came to be known, was no ordinary robot. He was designed as a household servant, but it soon became apparent to his owners that he was something unique, and that extraordinary quality was to win NDR-113 fame and notoriety. His difference aroused passion in human beings, admiration, fascination, and fear. For Andrew Martin was an artist, a creator, and over the years of a long life, robots do not die, Andrew gained fame as a sculptor, a writer, a scientist, and a phenomenon. He won his freedom, changed his body, became wealthy. He made friends and, because of what he was, many enemies. Only one thing was denied him, humanity, his final goal. To reach that goal would be a long, hard struggle that would involve, at last, a supreme irony. The late Isaac Asimov and SF Grandmaster Robert Silverberg collaborated on two earlier novels, Nightfall and The Child of Time, both based on Asimov's short stories. This final collaboration, based on Asimov's story The Bicentennial Man, is a notable addition to the robot stories which are among Isaac Asimov's most popular and enduring works. Alright, and now we've got the three laws of robotics right at the start here. Obviously these have been used uh, elsewhere in Asimov's work, but I thought it was worth recapping them. Uh, 1. A robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. 2. A robot must obey the orders given it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. 3. A robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. And obviously those are the kind of the laws that we, we play with throughout this book. For example, we get here uh, this little bit of dialogue here. Uh, someone's talking to the robot, he says, For all your skill, you must take orders from anyone, any human, a child, a fool, a bore, a rogue. The second law commands it. It leaves you no choice. Right this minute I could say, stand up, doctor, and you'd have to stand up. Put your fingers over your face and wiggle them, and you'd wiggle. Stand on one leg, sit down on the floor, move right or left. Anything I wanted to tell you, and you'd obey. I could order you to disassemble yourself limb by limb, and you would. You, a great surgeon. No choice whatsoever. A human whistles and you hop to this tune. Doesn't it offend you that I have the power to make you do whatever damn thing I please, no matter how idiotic, how trivial, how degrading? The surgeon was unfazed. It would be my pleasure to please you, sir, with certain obvious exceptions. If your order should happen to involve my doing any harm to you or any other human being, I would have to take the primary laws of my nature into consideration before obeying you, and in all likelihood I would not obey you. The first law, which concerns my duty to human safety, would take precedence over the second law relating to obedience. Otherwise, obedience is my pleasure. If it would give you pleasure to require me to do certain acts that you regard as idiotic or trivial or degrading, I would perform those acts, but they would not seem idiotic or trivial or degrading to me. We get a lot of references to Susan Calvin, who is a uh, very key, important figure in like the development of robots in Asimov's world, and um, she features heavily in iRobot. So I thought uh, this was an interesting start here, chapter 3. The time of year arrived when Miss celebrated her birthday. Andrew had already learned that one's birthday celebration was an important event in the annual round of human life, a commemoration of the anniversary of the day that one had emerged from one's mother's womb. Andrew thought it was strange that humans would choose the day of coming forth from the womb as the significant thing to commemorate. He knew something of human biology, and it seemed to him that it would be much more important to focus on the moment of the actual creation of the organism, when the sperm cell entered the ovum and the process of cell division began. Surely that was the real point of origin of any person. He, make, he makes a good point as well. And uh, so then the owner of the robot, he wants to create a, a bank account in the robot's name because the robot started making furniture and it's being sold. So he goes to the bank manager and... Um, and the bank manager says, There are no precedents so far as I've ever heard. I doubt that there's any law against it, but even so, robots aren't people. How can they have bank accounts? Corporations aren't people either, except in the most abstract sense. A legal fiction, as you would term it. Yet corporations have bank accounts. Well, I grant you that. But corporations have been recognised in the eyes of the law for centuries as entities qualified to own property of all sorts. Robots, Gerald, have no legal rights, as surely you must be aware. And simply as a procedural matter, let me remind you that corporations also have corporate officers and they sign the papers that establish the bank accounts. 
Who would open Andrew's account? You. And would it be Andrew's account if you opened it? I've opened bank accounts in the names of my children, Sir replied. Nevertheless, the accounts are theirs. Besides, Andrew can sign his name as well as you or I. And so then they turn to the robot and um, he says, Andrew, you're going to be, well, not a rich man, but a rich robot. Does that please you? Yes, sir. And what do you plan to do with the money you're going to make? Pay for things, sir, which otherwise, sir, would have had to pay for. It would save him expense, sir, which I think is a very robot answer. Uh, and so then Andrew, once he's earned, started earning money, he decides he wants to uh, buy his freedom. I should point out as well, like, the way this kind of develops, to begin with, he's, you know, just a robot, and he's uh, walking along with the Master's girls, and they ask him to swim out to this rock um, to fetch them some, like, driftwood. And he says he can't because it conflicts with the second law. He needs, he needs to protect human lives. What if he's away and something happens to them? But then later, when he's off duty, he gets the idea of, oh, okay, well, maybe I'll try it out. And he swims out and he figures he probably could have done it without putting them to putting them in danger. Not that he would have, of course. And uh, it's just this sort of slow process of questioning. So then the girls give him uh, this wood and a, bit, and a knife and ask him to make something. And he makes it and it turns out well. So they show their dad and the dad gives him better tools and asks him to make furniture. And um, yeah, it kind of all evolves from there, you know. And uh, so they agree, uh, he, the, the father and the daughter are talking, and the father says, Well, so then, so be it. We agree that Andrew is an artificial person. What of it? How does calling him an artificial person instead of a robot change anything? We're just playing games with words. A counterfeit banknote may be regarded as a banknote, but it's still counterfeit. And you can call a robot an artificial person, but it will still be... And then, a daughter report, and then the daughter interrupts saying, Father, what he wants is for you to grant him his freedom. And uh, so then he says, if we're going to give him his freedom, we need to do it properly, legally through the courts. But then when they go to the courts, they're opposed by the manufacturer of the robots because they basically argue, well, if you give this robot the freedom and argue that robots are people, suddenly they're no longer manufacturing like robots as essential goods. They're, you know, there's a civil rights movement. They're, uh, man you know, they're manufacturing and selling people. They're slave traders. And then they, uh, I think this is interesting in the COVID era because... They're going to have a, a court hearing about it and uh, basically it would be remote because that's just standard practice which obviously is becoming standard practice now but they insist on having an in-person appearance so that the judge can see the robot and see uh, for himself how human the robot is. Uh, and then the robot, he decides he wants to write a book about robots and uh, George says, a book about robots? A manual of design? Not at all. A history of their development is what I have in mind. Ah, George said. Nodding and frowning at the same time. Well then, let's walk home, shall we? You want to write a book on the history of robotics, George said, as if, as if revolving the concept in his mind. But why, Andrew? There are a million books on robotics already, and at least half a million of them go into the history of the robot concept. The world is growing saturated, not only with robots, but with information about them. Andrew shook his head, a human gesture that he had lately begun to make more and more frequently. Not a history of robotics, George. A history of robots, by a robot. Surely no such book has ever been written. I want to explain how robots feel about themselves, and especially about how it has been for us in our relationships with human beings ever since the first robots were allowed to work and live on Earth. And I think this is interesting too. He says, uh, As he studied the annals of robot development, Andrew at last understood why so many humans had been phobic about robots. It wasn't that the three laws were badly drawn. Not at all. Indeed, they were masterly exemplars of logic. The trouble was that humans themselves were not always logical, were, on occasion, downright illogical. And robots were not always capable of coping with the sweeps and curves and tangents of human thought. And then Andrew, um, he's a robot, so he can't lie. So he has to get, he asks a human to lie for him, and the human finds it very amusing. We just get a little mention of Alice in Wonderland. Um, uh, some, somebody says, you know, when I was a little boy, my grandfather used to read a book to me. An ancient book that I guess has been completely forgotten by now. A book called Alice in Wonderland. About a little girl of three or four hundred years ago who follows a rabbit down a hole and lands in a world where everything is completely absurd. Except, mo except no one knows it's absurd, so they take it terribly seriously. This is like something right out of that book. Or the sequel. Alvin in Wonderland, I could call it. Although I think there already is a sequel, actually. Magdescu was speaking very rapidly, almost wildly. Should I take this seriously, this set of upgrade schematics? It's not just a joke, is it? And yeah, um, I mean, there's this constant theme, the... the the robot is constantly upgrading himself throughout to become more and more human. And a lot of people are uncomfortable with that. And I think this is very telling. Basically, as part of his quest to become more human, the robot has developed a bunch of his own technology, which in order to get get it produced, basically, 
he uh, had to form some alliances uh, with one of the robot companies. And so the benefit to humanity of them doing this is that human gets all of these artificial hearts and stuff that can then save lives. Um, but it gets a little bit political at the same time. So um, we get this, this conversation here. Um, have you ever heard the old saying, no good deed goes unpunished? Andrew shrugged and shook his head. Such a statement makes no sense to me. I suppose not. You still aren't very comfortable with our little human irrationalities, are you? But what it means, basically, is that we have a way of turning on those who do us the greatest kindnesses. No, don't try to dispute it. It's just the way we are. Very well. And how does this apply to me? It will be said, perhaps, that you created prostatology mainly to serve your own needs. The argument will be raised that the whole science was merely part of a campaign to roboticize human beings or to humanify robots, and in either case it is something evil and vicious. No, Andrew said. I'm not able to comprehend that kind of reasoning. No, you can't, can you? Because ultimately you're a logical creature controlled by your positronic pathways. And there's no sort of upgrade, I suppose, that can make your way of thinking as erratic as ours can sometimes be. The true depths of irrationality are beyond your reach, which you should not take as any criticism of you, only as a simple statement of the realities. You are very human in most essential respects, Mr. Martin, but you are incapable, I'm afraid, of understanding just how far from rationality human beings will go when they believe their interests are at stake. But if their interests are at stake, Andrew said, I would think they would attempt to be as rational as possible so that they would be able to... No, please. There's no way I can make you truly understand. Very true. And then there's this argument made towards the robot. They say, uh, you go to fine restaurants and order splendid meals and drink the best wines I've noticed, though I can't imagine what value that can have for you other than for appearances sake. That is value enough for me, said Andrew. All right. Plenty of humans probably can't appreciate the expensive wines they drink either, but they drink them, f but they drink them for the same reason you do. Your organs are artificial, but so are met so many of theirs. And uh, I just love this, where we get this reference back to Bicentennial Man. So basically, originally he was, what was he called? He was called um, the Sesquicentennial Robot, which means the robot that's lived to 150 years. And uh, when he reaches his 200th birthday, they declare him no longer a sesquicentennial robot or whatever it was. They declare him a bicentennial man. So yeah, all in all, as you can tell, really enjoyed reading this book. Uh, I think for me, what I love about Asimov and the, the stuff that he, he writes, even though I'm assuming most of this, if not all of it, was actually Robert Silverberg. And it, it did read like an Asimov novel as well, so he kind of nailed the tone. But um, I just really enjoy the kind of ethical and moral questions that it asks, and those are really what I've been highlighting in this review. Overall, I definitely would recommend it, especially if you're interested in science fiction. Gave it a pretty solid 4.25, maybe even a 4.5 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Positronic Man by Isaac Asimov and Robert Silverberg. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon in another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.